This is a special episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR Day 3, today with Dr. Shaheen Rafi. Hey, everybody. We are Dr. Daylon James and Dr. Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. We're back with our third episode discussing the highlights from the 2021 ISSCR annual meeting. If you're tuning in for the first time, be sure to head over to the Stem Cell Podcast website or Stem Cell Technologies YouTube channel, where you can find video of today's episode, as well as videos for the episodes covering the previous two days of the meeting. Today, we'll be talking with my mentor and great friend, Dr. Shaheen Rafi. He's from the Wild Cornell Medical College, talking to him about his thoughts on the meeting. But before we get to that. Stem Cell Technologies is committed to supporting your research from discovery to the clinic with reagents and support for your HPSC derived cell and gene therapies. You can learn more about their approach to quality by design at Stem Cells Innovation Showcase tomorrow at noon Eastern time, that's Eastern US. For additional information about how stem cell can support your culture safety, reproducibility, and performance, visit the Stem Cell Virtual Booth. All right, Arun, I'm gonna start today's roundup with the uh, Tobias Award lecture, which went this year to Stu Orkin, much deserved. He's a legend, mm -hmm. living legend in the field, still contributing. Um, but for me, it was really uh, an agreeable symmetry in terms of having David Liu present earlier in the day. Uh, we covered that in yesterday's show. If you missed it, uh, check it out. Um, and then uh, later in the day for the award lecture, Stu Orkin. The reason why, because, uh, you know, it was two guys working on hemoglobinopathies, uh, but at different poles, right? Um, of course, you know, there's a, a lot more to be done and, and we're waiting to see how all these therapies play out. But, you know, notably in this case, uh, the, the lesson for me was that sometimes uh, technology and time, you know, uh, gives you a precision approach, approach in the case of base editing that kind of um, obviates the hack, uh, which was the reversion to fetal hemoglobin that Stu Orkin has been working on for more than a decade. Um, but I, I think that the greater point there that Stu Orkin made at the end, uh, which resonated with me is that, you know, when you talk about the disease burden of uh, a lot of these hemoglobinopathies, specifically sickle cell, uh, which affects more than 300,000 kids born new each year, uh, that, you know, having base editing as your primary arrow in the quiver. I don't know if that's really gonna do it uh, given the high cost and early stage of those therapeutics. He made the point that, you know, some of these hacks may, um, may address the problem in, in the developed world. So it was really nice uh, to see that both of these players at, at the top of their game still um, and, and much more to come uh, but they're both uh, really addressing disease at the root now. It's really exciting to see, and, and he really deserves uh, all the plaudits and, and acclaim that go with this award. Uh, he's done a lot, contributed a great deal to the field. Yeah, he's a legend at the ISSCR and the stem cell world and the hematopoiesis world. And just FYI, he's technically, technically my scientific grandfather because he is the postdoc mentor of Sean Wu, who is my PhD mentor. So, you know, one degree removed, that's how it works in the world of science. It's a small world. But yes, he's a legend in hematopoiesis. He talked about his uh, um, studies on the, you know, the uh, on the GATA family of transcription factors and how they're really critical to the development of the blood, the diseases of different, you know, sickle cell diseases, disease of the blood, hemoglobinopathies, um, and kind of building on what you're talking about there, I think a lot of this comes down to the accessibility of the technology. Like we had talked about yesterday with the accessibility of all these omics approaches, um, in some sense, you know, we have perhaps even started to cure and perhaps have cured sickle cell disease with these gene editing approaches, with these gene therapies and so on. But now it's a matter of getting these approaches and getting these therapies to everybody who needs them. And that's easier said than done, unfortunately. So moving on to the theme sessions from that particular afternoon, yesterday afternoon, uh, I went to a session called Tissue Development and Maintenance. There were some really nifty technologies that were being presented here. Some of them we've actually covered on the show. Um, a lot of trainees, again, that we'd like to highlight. 
One is Juan Alvarez I'm talking about quote unquote cyborg organoids. I don't know if you remember this. Actually, we we uh, covered this on the the show a, f- a few years ago. It might have been one of the earliest roundup papers that I actually ever covered. Um, there are these like multi electrode arrays that you can wrap around an organoid so that you can get a real time electrophysiological readout of how the organoid is actually functioning. I think back then we actually covered it in the context of the heart. But Dr. Alvarez here is actually focusing more on the islet organoid and using these implanted nanoelectrics to uh, assay for islet organoid function. And he's actually starting up his own lab at UPenn. So uh, keep an eye out for, for his lab. Evan Appleton over at the Church Lab, who is, of course, well known for everything. Dr. Church has a hand in everything, stem cell, synthetic biology, genome editing, genomics these days, right? And uh, he was talking about their work in machine-guided cell fate engineering and precisely controlling cell differentiation through the manipulation of different transcription factors. We actually also covered this on the show uh, recently. There, I think, a Nature Biotech article that was the foundation of a company. Of course, we're talking about George Church, so he's got another company in the works, but this is the foundation of a company um, utilizing different transcription factors and targeted approaches to actually quickly and efficiently change cell fate from one cell type to another. So um, another cool technology coming out of the church lab. Eri Tekamatsu talking about the BMP2 surrogate using nanobodies for cartilage regeneration. David Sachs actually had a, a nifty cardiac tube model on a chip to actually study heart development. One of the big limitations of studying the heart outside of the body and in vitro is recapitulating some of these complex developmental processes like the, the looping of the heart and everything like that that goes on. And perhaps this is a very simplified approach to studying the heart tube formation. And they send some of their work to the space station, which I'm a big fan of, as you know. Um, Nan Huang from Stanford, who I know pretty well, modeling limb ischemia and peripheral artery disease using nanoparticle scaffold and IPS drive endothelial cells. And then finally, Jennifer Lewis, whose work we've also covered on the show recently, uh, talking about the in vitro vascularization of the human kidney and also cardiac tissues using some of their SWIFT technology. I don't know if you remember that sacrificial bioink paper that we talked about a few years ago. So um, nice range of technologies coming from different cell types, from the eyelid all the way to the heart, um, different ways you can you know, integrate electronics and uh, real-time analyses to kind of take the um, the this basic science here to the next level. And I think uh, you'll pick it up with the next day. Is that right? Yes. But before we get to that, I just want to mention, I, I've noticed a lot of Harvard. I don't know if you've seen this too. It's Harvard, 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 all the trainees, all the investigators. I mean, Harvard's a great place, enriched with the finest investigators. But, um, you know, I always get excited when I see people that aren't from the Mecca of uh, sure. all things intellectual. But speaking of Harvard, I just want to touch on uh, the hematopoietic session. Arun, are you kidding me? You thought I wouldn't talk about the hematopoietic <laughs> session? You and your sure. stem cells. Well, yes, of course, there was a session that was um, proclaimed by Lenz on the, the session chair, only he can get away with this. Going to be the best, best of the meeting. Um, and it was very, it was a great session. Um, and uh, Len anchored it. He talked about clonal dominance. Uh, it was an exciting talk. I would check that out on rebroadcast if I were you. But I'm now kicking it to the next day um, in the concurrence in the morning, uh, just to highlight some of the the uh, trainees who aren't from Harvard. Uh, there was uh, Sean Lau, who who is from Rusty Gage's lab. He had a nice story on uh, metabolomics. I mean, this the whole theme of this session was really about metabolomics and our aging. Um, and it, it for me, it really underscored all the suite of technologies that are being levered um, for stem cell science nowadays that are really being showcased in this meeting. In this case, um, I was looking at iPS-derived dopaminergic neurons. Um, also, there was uh, Jessica Garburn um, from Harvard. What a coincidence. Who was looking at a cardiomyocyte maturation. Uh, it's from the Richard Lee lab. Um, and here it was interesting because the takeaway for me was that in our everyday normal cell culture is that a lot of the conditions may be pr- promoting senescence. And uh, part of the counterintuitively, pa- part of the way that we may be able to mature cells 
is by inhibiting that senescence because it's kind of an all or nothing choice. So she was using these synolytics or um, inhibitors of senescence to try and promote uh, maturation of cardiomyocytes. That was an exciting and I thought innovative idea. And then there was Marlon Noblick from Lausanne in Switzerland who had another cool um, concept, I thought, which was the lipid droplets uh, in governing and influencing neural progenitor cell differentiation and behavior. Uh, because I, I think these are some of the things in, in, in uh, studying the, the metabolic activity uh, and its relationship to pathology that, you know, you see the plaques in neurodegenerative conditions and maybe you don't really consider that the accumulation of lipid droplets may contribute to those plaques, but it's, it's obvious uh, when you really consider it. So um, that was cool. Also, uh, Yang Yao, who was from uh, Hans Snook Lab at Columbia, good old fashioned meat and potatoes. I love some, some good old Cree models and some nice transplantation analysis. You know what I mean? That's, that for me is like, it, it's always a, a joy um, to, uh, to see. Um, and then uh, finally, Anne Brunet from Stanford uh, had a really nice talk uh, presenting a lot of her unpublished data looking at uh, how she used ataxic um, to try and understand uh, migratory behaviors in uh, neuroprogenitors and their derivatives and, and neurogenesis and aged uh, versus young brains. So it, it was a, a nice collection. I thought I, I was kind of bouncing in between both the concurrence but all in, I thought it was, it was, it was for me, a good presentation of, you know, aging, metabolomics, because that's just not my wheelhouse. So, and that's what's great about this meeting is you get exposed to all these things that may, um, you know, seed some kind of new ideas or experiments in your own work. So it was a great uh, two hours for me in that afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess shifting now to the next day, to, this is what, this is day three now. Is that right? Day three? Yeah. So we're at day three, plenary four, self-organization of developmental processes. Um, we'll jump right into some of the talks here. And uh, there are a couple that really stood out for me, but starting off with Anne grappen botten who is uh, using 3D, mod 3D models of pancreas organogenesis, organ um, looking at the 3D expansion of pancreatic progenitors, and in particular, the advantages of growing pa these pancreatic progenitors in 3D organoids. They're actually more mature. They're able to, in, in the context of the pancreas, they're able to actually divide a bit more. So I know you're talking about the mat maturity of different cell types, right? For cardiomyocytes, you don't want them necessarily to divide more. That's a hallmark of their maturity is their senescence and their you know, be becoming post mitotic, but in the case of the pancreas and these pancreatic progenitors, perhaps you do want them to continue to expand. So that's a, that's a positive, um, something to think about. Next up was perhaps my favorite talk, one of my favorite talks so far, perhaps my favorite talk so far from Nicholas Verone, who we're actually going to be having on the show pretty soon. I think uh, he's going to be our last guest as part of our ISCR series here. He's talking about blastoids and modeling mammalian blastocyst development and implantation ex vivo, ex vivo and in vitro. And of course, there's been a, a lot of talk about using these embryoid models, these embryo models, such as the gastroloids and blastoids for better studying human development in a dish. And the ICR guidelines have been reworked in part to adapt to these technologies. But he was presenting some beautiful unpublished work uh, using high throughput screens with these blastoids and also just aesthetically one of the most beautiful presentations I've ever seen. Honestly, I'm aspiring to develop PowerPoints that are all black, black backgrounds. There's just one immunofluorescence on every single slide. And that's what he had here. So just mwah, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Um, it was, uh, he was talking about in the actual meat and potatoes of the talk, how close are human blastoids to the real thing? And in fact, they are quite close and when, based on his uh, single cell data and really nifty work. I believe it's, it's unpublished. It might be on bioarchive, really neat work using these blastoids to model human implantation uh, using actually endometrial organoids, everything outside of the body. It's all in vitro. So just think about it. You're, you're actually modeling this very early step in human development and, and reproduction outside of the uterus. That's mind-blowing to me. 
Yes. Uh, and I mean, we had him on the show way back when he um, dropped his Blastoid story. And I think th this is the thing for me that, that it's a bit of a red herring is everyone is so focused on the, the you know, reproductive potential of these Blastoids. Um, but he, he said it and he very explicitly said at the beginning of the talk, nobody has been able to make a mouse. Um, from these mouse blastoids. Presumably no one would be able to make it from a human eye blastoid either. Um, and also I think he emphasized the point that you're alluding to there is that the real uh, value of the tool is to use it to understand basic mechanistic concepts, right? Um, in this case of implantation and polarization of the early embryo and like his, his exploration of the stickiness, like that's fundamental, right? And this is something that you can never look at in the human system because it's a black box, right? But uh, now in this new era, we have a tool and we have a tool that'll help us to understand basic mechanisms and gene networks that underlie the signaling of implantation. And that can be, mean a big difference for reproduction, not because we're making embryos, but because we're, we're solving the problems that may underlie failure to implantation in a large select, selection of patients. I mean, it's relatively common and I'm sure it's something that is increased with aging embryos. So um, these are tools that we can use to solve real problems. Forget about the ethics for a minute and just think about the value of the tool. Uh, and, and I think for me, that's a takeaway. I can't wait to talk to him on the podcast, because I, I think we, we will chat about that, uh, about how he's in the middle of this uh, kind of bioethical maelstrom when uh, really people should be lauding him for generating a whole new platform. I wonder if that's a distraction for him or I wonder if he's just, you know, become a nerd to it. <laughs> uh, we'll have to see. But before we get to that chat in a couple of days, we're going to talk to Shaheen Rafi, my great friend. We'll try and keep that conversation PG. Uh, don't hold me accountable, Arun. This guy has a lot to say. Um, and when we get together, we, we, we get a little bit, um, well, we'll see how it plays. Before we get to that, I have a special message from Stem Cell Technologies. Modeling liver toxicity and metabolism are two key aspects of developing new therapeutics. Hepaticult organoid kit for human tissues generates physiologically relevant liver organoids that can be adapted to a range of culture protocols, including organoid derived monolayers in high throughput formats, providing a more relevant model system for studying hepatic regeneration, metabolism, and disease. You can learn, learn more at www.stemcell.com slash hepatic cult dash human. Now, without further ado, Let's have some fun. All right, here we are with my mentor, uh, a man I admire greatly, a uh, great friend and a great scientist, Dr. Shaheen Rafi. He's from Weill Cornell Medical College, professor there. The Rafi Laboratory focuses on stem cell biology and angiogenesis, uh, uses in vivo mouse models and mouse and human genetics, tissue culture approaches, molecular biology to model angiogenesis and cancer and stem cell metabolic regulation, genetic, genomic, molecular and cell biological techniques. They do it all. They're combined to achieve a systems level understanding of these complex processes. Shaheen, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. And give me a brief overview. What are you thinking of the meeting so far? Been good. Uh, thank you for uh, Daylon and Arun inviting me for this podcast. Uh, podcast. Uh, I think it in very inspiring, but uh, uh, I think it's one step at a time. I still, I'm looking forward. Eventually, a lot of this presentation is going to be translated to the clinical setting. Uh, and uh, as we realize with the pandemic, we still. Um, need to make major breakthroughs in translational medicine to treat uh, many regenerative medicine uh, problems and have. Yeah, I would agree with you there, but I think we're, the good news is we're involved in a field that's at the forefront of, you know, bringing translation to reality in, in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's great to finally meet you, Dr. Rafi. You know, Dalen has said so many great things about you and how he's inspired you. So great to finally meet you. Not in person, but perhaps one day. So, um, so I did want to ask you about 
a lot of the the vascularization work that's been presented at the meeting and and in particular um, how we can properly vascularize these 3D tissue constructs. You know, everybody's talking about bioprinting endothelial cells and even bioprinting vasculature into these complex organoids and 3D tissue constructs. But I wanted to get your take on it. What, what do you think is the right way to actually induce vascularization in these complex constructs? Is it, you know, the natural approach where you activate angiogenic pathways in these constructs? Or do you think printing is actually going to, to make a stand and the right way to do it. So what do you think? That's an outstanding question. And I think that um, um, you hit upon the major low hanging fruits of vascularization of organs for translational medicine. So let me start by saying that um, one major hurdle in regenerative medicine uh, that has not made its way to the clinical setting to benefit the patients with end-stage organ failure or organ damage or genetic disorder is the fact that when you transplant a explant or an organoid or anything, poor vascular supply result in uh, necrosis or fibrosis or scarring. But during the last 30 years, since the angiogenesis become a very exciting and very mechanistic type field of biology, um, we have learned that there are close to maybe 240 different endothelial cells in our human body. In liver alone, there are close to 12 different capillary endothelial cells. In the kidney alone, we reported uh, about two years ago, there are 20 different type of endothelial cells. In the brain, it's been reported more than. So if you put all of this together, the diversity of the endothelial cell is tremendous. Not only endothelial cells are diversified, endothelial that are specialized within each organ, they themselves diversify the organs. By that, I mean a sinusoidal endothelium in the liver teaches a hepatocyte how to stay put, how to function, biochemical, biomechanical, and all those functions. So if we eventually want to make a huge stride in translational or even understanding the physiology of the blood vessels, we have to be able to make organotypic endothelial cells that have the, both the signature of intra-organ and inter-organ endothelial cell function. So one of the major problems with the presentation in the ICCR, I don't hear a single word about vascular adaptability. And in fact, they don't mention the paper that we just published. That, by the way, is uh, one of my uh, the major hits. We have up to uh, 28,000 visits. The title is Adaptable and Hemodynamic Endothelium for Organogenesis and Tumorogenesis. So you can print the endothelial cells. You can put a scaffold. You can put anything you want. If your endothelial cells that you put in there, either from pluripotent stem cell-derived endothelium or you isolate from the tissues, if those endothelial cells lack the capacity to adapt biochemically, biophysically, structurally to the tissue that you want them to vascularize, if you transplant those organs, may not work as efficiently. So I think in the vascular field, everybody agrees that we need to generate organotypic, specialized, customized endothelial cell for every tissue. So I think that's the major weakness of every presentation, that the whole focus in bioengineering, but not the real physiology of the endothelial cells. I, uh, of course, uh, agree because I've been completely indoctrinated over a decade of uh, working with you and talking with you. But um, also, it, it, you make a very convincing case, but it, it's, it's, and the work uh, speaks for itself, of course. But I, I think it's, there's a bit of a disconnect because like you, I look at the conference and everyone's still talking about endothelium. They talk about it a lot. Endothelium is huge here. Where they talk about we need to vascularize these organoids for scale or to make them more physiological, but more physiological in the sense that like they look like tissue with tubes running through it, right? But the, the idea 
the seminal idea of angiocrine, I don't think has really you know, percolated all the way through the scientific community, or at least it's not apparent. I mean, I will say Takanori Takebe just gave a great talk um, today in the, the plenary about uh, generating liver sinusoidal endothelial cells and how it, you had to have you know, a heterogeneous, different types of endothelium in the same culture. So I, I guess they're starting to get it, but the whole idea of um, the real, the guiding influence of endothelium in generating the tissues and organs themselves, you know, uh, I don't think that people ha have recognized necessarily yet that in order to get the, the best liver cell, you want to have the signals from endothelium or lung cell or vice versa, at least not in a, in a pluripotent differentiation cell context. Why do you think um, it's taken so long uh, for these ideas to, to you know, <laughs> I'm, this may be a bit of a powder keg, but what do you think the challenge is? You know, because you're focusing ICCR that unfortunately uh, they are, they don't uh, foster a lot of niche talks or vascular niche talks and all of that. Right now, next week, there is a huge German, uh, German meeting uh, organized by Dr. Helmut Augustin. The whole, uh, <laughs> there are like 50 speakers in this, is about angiocon function of organotypic endothelium. Mm. So it has picked up. Mm. Uh, the whole symposium about this angiocon function and especially that the concept of uh, even the lymphatic endothelial cells are different than they produce angiocrine factor called lymph angiocrine was mm -hmm. just published uh, in Nature where, uh, where uh, Guillermo Olivier shows that the cardiac lymphatic system produces lymph angiocrine. So I think the ICCR um, is focused on stem cell biology, but I think the, the, the concept of organ-specific endothelial cells uh, playing a role in organ regeneration is being not accepted in the main arena of vascular biology, and many vascular biologists are working on that. And I think gradually ICCR is going to embrace this conceptual framework. And I think the whole, you know, I give you an example of modified RNA. Kariko Caitlin and Drew Wiseman was talking about this 2005. And in fact, I wrote a commentary on the first paper from Derek Rossi and Ken Chian in Nature Biotech. You and I reviewed that paper. They injected modified RNA for VEGF to induce angiogenesis. Mm -hmm. Nobody was interested, right? <laughs> you know, nobody was saying, oh, modified RNA for VEGF. Why we have to do this? That, was it presented in any symposium? Howard Hughes never funded that. They said, this is crap. NIH wasn't funding it. Many organizations ignored, but the, the way a lot of these things unfortunately get recognized and appropriately so when it works in the clinical setting. Once now a pseudo uridine modification on an RNA that was proposed by the discoverer of modified RNA saved humanity, you and I are talking because ICCR is meeting because of that, clearly shows clinical validation is the proof of principle. So I think the next step for vascular biology is that we need to somehow translate organotypic angiocon function to a clinical setting that can benefit the patient population. And I think once that happens, and it's going to happen, um, that is going to get more recognized and recognized. And I think scientific discoveries and validation in clinic, um, I was always disappointed that that's to happen, but I have come to the reality that that's a way that as a basic scientist myself can prove my principle for that. So I think the next few years is going to be a defining moment about organotypic endothelial function. If as vascular biologists, you yourself, Dehilan, and Arun, we can prove that generation of the organotypic endothelium that produce the fine angiocrine factor is essential to get better organs, benefit the patient, then I think the field is going to embrace this with open arm and we're going to start to make, uh, make perform mechanistic study, NIH funding is going to go up, 
you're going to see presentation in ICCR and in many, and it's going to take off. So the burden of the proof is on us. Mm, yeah. So let's, uh, so since you brought it up, let's talk about the, the heterogeneity of different endothelial subtypes, right? You mentioned that there's hundreds and hundreds of different subtypes of endothelial cells. And l- let's even take it away from the, the translational side of things and, you know, putting these things in, in patients and all that. Let's just talk about the disease modeling. Since all these single cell atlas papers have come out now, and they're demonstrating that, like you said, there are a huge variety of endothelial subtypes out there, you know, organ specific endothelial cells. Do you think this in in some ways invalidates the work that we're doing with some of the disease modeling approaches uh, in vitro is we're just not using the right types of endothelial cells for our work. We're differentiating vascular endothelial cells from iPSCs that are CD144 positive and just calling them vascular endothelial cells when in reality, if say I wanted to do cardiac disease modeling, I have to generate a cardiac subtype of endothelial cell. Do you, do you think we really need to start taking a next step and perhaps even reconsidering some of the work that we've done. That's another very deep, thoughtful question. So you're asking, how can we make, how can we get a generic endothelium um, and try to use all the single cell data that are published, all the other information that are published, start to think about how we can construct, devise, organ-specific endothelium. So if you read our recent paper, uh, Brisa Palacucci et al. uh, in last September, you're gonna realize we have made a big step toward answering your question. So we use this transcription factor ATB2, which is an ETS factor that is embryonically induced during the first phase of vasculogenesis in the first in mouse is uh, up to um, day six, and in humans probably first uh, first month of development. And this ATB2 sets in motion, um, and Daylon has worked extensively with this factor to understand his physiology and biology. Uh, set in motion the vascular genesis, vascular, basically general generic endothelial cell. Then ATB2 turns off; it's gone never comes back. And then other transcription factors such as fly ERG takes over. So what we did, we we took this ETV2 that is absent is 99% of the adult endothelial cell and then we put back this in transiently, like recapitulating its developmental uh, process in adult stringent endothelium. What we found that that the ETV2, um, we have done now ataxic goes and opens up all those areas in the chromatin, unendothelial cell, that were shut off to make a specialized endothelium. Now it poises all the promoter regions, all the enhancers regions. If the five prime UTR of the genes on endothelial cell that can generate the generic endothelium. Now, because all these enhancer elements are poised, we realize that not only we have now made a generic endothelium, these endothelial cells are super responsive to the microenvironmental stimuli. In the figure four, in the figure five of our paper, we show that if we get now this generic human endothelial cell, we put them with organoids such as colon organoid, epithelial cell in colon organoid, send the signal to this uneducated, immature, generic endothelium, and they make him like colon endothelium. By contrast, if you put them with colon tumor cancers, this ETB2, which we call them reset vascular endothelial cell, or VEX, now got educated like a maladaptive endothelium. And in fact, now we have five, six other papers lined up right now, where we have made sinusoidal endothelium. Dr. Takepo didn't told us which transcription factor <laughs> regulates the uh, sinusoidal endothelium. In fact, in front of me, we are submitting a paper in cell where we have found a transcription factor. When we knock it out, liver sinusoidal endothelial cell disappears. And if I put it back, it becomes sinusoidal endothelium. We discovered that through the ETV2 mechanism. 
we took generic endothelium, we put it with liver cells, and we realized liver cell turns on CMAF. On this is endothelium, they become capillary sinusoidal endothelium. So our own VR and Delon, we are ready to rock and roll now. I have endothelium that is ready to get educated. I can give it to you. And that's the problem. People who organize ICCR, you know, our paper should have been highlighted because that's the first, um, you know, you know, it, it, it's the first organotypic endothelium ever made and validated by other group that is going to make a major impact. So I believe ATB2 uneducated generic adaptable endothelium is just tip of an iceberg. We're going to find out what are the mechanisms are there to make a generic endothelium to make them specialized. I just want to emphasize this because I know it's only 15 minutes. When you take a fibroblast and you put OCT4 and you take it all the way back to an embryonic stage, ARC4 is extremely powerful transcription factor that opens us the enhancer and elements of many, many other genes and erases the genom genomic imprinting. It erases the genomic imprinting. One more time, erases genomic imprinting. You go to ISCR, everybody ignores that. Because you, you want to make sure, you want to say this was good, right. but it's not. You erase the genomic imprinting, and because of that, when you want to get a IPS derived endothelium to educate, we try that. Even when we put ETB2, it doesn't work. Mm. But if you, when you get the adult endothelial cells and you put ETB2, it's like taking a specialized grad student like you guys. Let's say if I want to ask you to become engineer, I can do two things to you guys. I can put OCT4, bring you back to fetal stage. Then you have to take kindergarten courses. You have to take other courses, go to high school, junior school, college, and then become engineer. But ETB2 or our approach doesn't take you all the way back. I'll take you guys. I bring you back to college. And then you can take engineering courses and become engineer. You want to become a lawyer, become law school. Our strategy is much safer, much more physiological, much more relevant than just getting an IPS drive cell and try to educate them. Because the chromatin of IPS drive endothelial cell, as Daylon Beauty is shown, is confused. Even when ETB2 goes there, it doesn't know what to do. There are too many doors to close, too many doors to open. One day we eventually want to find out how to harness the potential of, 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 of OCT4 on endothelial cell. But I think we have solved a major hurdle on making an adaptive genetic endothelium. And we stop the upon thanks to Daylon on this ETV2 for allow us to do that. So I think to answer your question, I have the answer. Just read our paper. We have an adaptable endothelium. I can put it in any chip that was described or anything, and they can adjust to become a sinusoidal endothelium, liver, uh, uh, venous endothelium, arterial endothelium. So I think we have solved one of the major hurdles on generating adaptable endothelium. Yes, that, that is a landmark study. And I should say, in defense of ISSCR, they did highlight the story last year but before it was published. You gave a presentation on that. I don't know if you recall. You've been given so many presentations. I don't care for me to present, but you can ask my people. But it's different when you mentioned Dr. T okay, go ahead. That, that's fine. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. You, you, uh, I think uh, the work is, is well appreciated. And little did I know that I contributed. I'm getting a lot of credit here on the show. I didn't know I deserved, but hey, I'll take it. Um, look, listen, and, and bottom line here, I think that for you, it's clear, I don't know if everyone knows to look at you, but you're very passionate about your science. And um, I, I think people should know that that really comes from, you know, you talk about yourself rightfully as a basic scientist first, but before you were a basic scientist, you were a, a medical doctor, oncologist who, um, you know, saved a lot of people's lives and your commitment to healthcare and the patient I think stems from that initial effort. And I just want to give a brief anecdote. 
that, you know, over the years, we spent a lot of days, a lot of mornings in your office. And I was an early guy like you, you probably were sleeping there when I got there. So whatever, but I get there at seven a.m. I remember every single, when we were reviewing papers, it was like every day, or we were uh, submitting papers like every day for weeks and every single day, like clockwork at like seven or 7.30, um, this beautiful old lady who was a patient of yours 10, 15 years prior, back when you were still practicing, she called every day uh, just to mm -hmm. shoot the shit. And you, you'd have a conversation, how are you doing? And I think that people should know this about you, that you are, are the most caring physician. Yeah, and, um, and I think that it colors, I think a lot of what people don't know about, about all the people that are on the show at this conference is that if they come at you with the science, it's because you know they, they've, they've really devoted their lives to um, taking care of people and uh, addressing their disease. So I wanna put that out there in case everyone thinks that you're, you're throwing shade on anything here. Um, at the end of the tunnel, there's nothing but light with Shaheen Rafi. All right, that's my man. And uh, we only have time for that. So with that, you know, brief little homage, I'm going to have to to move on. But um, okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Daylan. And, and I, you guys, Arun, if you want to come to New York, let me know. Very <laughs> Will do. It's good. Good to meet you. Finally. Good to meet you. Take care. All right, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast to find out what we're doing at the meeting and check back here tomorrow for our next episode. Tomorrow, we're talking to Dr. Sheila Chari. All right, Shaheen, oh, Sheila Chari, cell stem cell. Maybe oh you want a guest God. in there and put in a good word for your next story with the CMAF. What do you say? Absolutely. Actually, that's what we're sending you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll put her on our radar. <laughs>